Tiger Youth Forum, Ben Jacobs with you. Remember to engage with me. My own personal handle is at Jacobs Ben if you want to send me a photograph of where you're watching. I'm trying to sort of put together a global map and find out in the world how many countries we are represented by. We've got well over 500 delegates now. So tweet me with a flag or a photograph. I'd like to see a home office. Are you under the covers watching us? Are you outside if you've got better weather? And can, of course, go outside because it's safe to do so. And on that note, of course, everyone at SEGA wishes you full health and hopes that you've not been too affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. We are here in London at our brand new studio. I'd like to thank SoccerX for providing it over the course of the last two days. And we'll use that studio to move on to our next panel now. Five o'clock, why global business needs do more for sport integrity. On this panel, we've got Paul Kakemo, the founder and CEO of UP2US Sports. We've got David Callow, the president of Sam Bader Sports Science Association. We've got Evan Brandoff, the CEO of League Side, and Jawa Pedro Maltes, an advisor to the National Olympic Committee of Portugal. Your moderator is a SEGA champion, a real friend of ours here, who always acts with so much integrity and engages with us at every single one of our events. And we're very pleased that he can moderate this one. It is, of course, Dan Maddox from CEM. Dan, good afternoon. It's over to you. Good afternoon, Ben. Thank you for the, uh, the very kind intro. And uh, I'll just give a little more, jump right in, um, give a little more background on our, our panelists, and then we'll jump into questions. So Paul Kakamo has been a leader in nonprofits for over 25 years, um, founder of America Scores, and started Up To Us Sports, a national service coaching initiative in 2009. Evan Brandoff is the co-founder of League Side, which is an amazing program of 11,000 sports organizations, youth sports organizations that connects brands and sponsors with youth uh, organizations and really tries to provide access to sports for all kids. Um, and as you said, Joao, uh, Pedro Maltes is a, an advisor to the Portuguese National Olympic Committee, um, training as a lawyer and is working on a number of issues related to education um, and awareness um, in that field. So we have a number of perspectives. And of course, David Kalo, who is, uh, really an overachiever at a young age, is president of uh, the organization, um, the Filipino Sports Organization, Sports Science Association and Human Kinetics, and is very active in trying to push the agenda of how sports can impact um, everybody, not just elite athletes. So um, thanks everybody for participating. Let's jump right in. Um, you know, we've got different perspectives from the Olympic movement, from countries and from youth organizations. When you talk about the opportunities for global business or brands to do more for sport integrity and to impact youth sports in particular, um, I'll start with Paul. What, what do you think is the, the opportunities or the responsibility for, for domestic or global brands to be actively um, supporting uh, youth sport and sport integrity in particular? Yeah, well, Dan, I think that uh, sports in general right now has more meaning than ever before because we've all been affected by the crisis of the last year. And so it's, it's raised an awareness, I think, certainly in the United States, but I think around the world about issues like racial equality, like health and wellness with COVID, like mental health and the impact of not being able to play sports. So when you have that kind of consciousness being raised and especially the impact it's gonna have on the younger generation and that from a business perspective, is really the younger generation of consumers, then you really have an opportunity for those who invest in sports to go deeper and say, this is more than just the game that we love, but this is about creating health opportunities for kids, uh, creating educational advancement, creating, addressing their mental health and social well being, and also racial equality and just social justice, gender equality, uh, LGBTQT equality. Like, how do we create a better world now using the world's games, the platform, and how do corporate, corporate uh, entities say that our investment is really going to connect? with this new generation that has this level of social consciousness, especially after what we've all been through this year. Well, you, you mentioned something, Paul, that I wanna build on because you, you obviously can't avoid the disruption to sports and youth sports because of COVID and then all the other social, political and economic issues that have come up. And also both showing the, 
desperate need for sports related to mental health and, and physical fitness, um, as well as, as the challenges um, and economic challenges with, with people being able to get together. Evan, you know, you have 11,000 sports organizations, youth organizations. What have you seen as, as the, you know, new opportunities that have come from this um, related to some of those subjects of mental health and participation and some of the benefits that sports can provide? There's so much data that suggests that kids that play sports are big, so much healthier, both, both physically and mentally. Uh, and what we've seen this past year, the, the metric that we're proud of here at Leeside, and, and it shows uh, what brands are thinking about in terms of how to invest uh, their, their corporate advertising dollars is the fact that our net revenue retention this past year was over 120% meaning that brands that are sponsoring youth sports leagues are not just continuing to sponsor youth sports leagues, but are doubling down and sponsoring more youth sports leagues because they understand that to, to both Paul and, and Dan, your, your point as well, that in order to engage with their target consumers, they need to be able to support their, their physical well-being and their mental well-being. And sponsoring youth sports organizations is, is giving them the ability to connect with families on a, a local level, uh, make sure that the 30% of youth sports organizations that are at risk of shutting down are staying uh, open and, and able to play and, and giving kids the opportunity to get back in the field uh, and, and pursue sports, which is helping them uh, set the foundations to succeed in, in, in life past sports as well. Um, so, uh, Evan, when you're talking about sports, obviously we're talking about participation on a grassroots level. So all, all levels of, of skill in sports. And then you have Joao, you know, from representing an Olympic committee, obviously you're talking about the highest level of elite athletes that COVID and the disruption and the postponement of the Tokyo games, um, has had major impact on, um, what have you seen in terms of like new voices coming in during this moment? Have brands stepped up to support that even further? And obviously we've seen so many athletes have stronger voices on, on different subjects. Um, you know, what have you seen from Portuguese athletes related to even their participation in Tokyo related to the risks and the dynamics of where our attention and energy should go related to sports and, and, the, and the positive aspects of culturally that sports can have on people's lives? Well, uh, um, first of all, thank you for the introduction, the kind of introduction and Thanks for the invitation and for having me here. Well, I, I have to say that uh, Olympics and the, the big question between uh, the sports values and the sports of business and the values of business that we have nowadays with uh, the, the big question of canceling or postponing the, the, the games are key for our athletes. We are focused on creating conditions to athletes be on the best shape ever on that uh, great uh, sports event. Uh, but we have also great sponsors now named partners on IOC and being from being partners of IOC are also partners of all NOCs like Airbnb or Allianz, Procter & Gamble that are uh, following these principles of integrity like we saw very recently on maybe on the Super Bowl, Airbnb made uh, an ad addressing the, 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 the need of exception, the difference between different uh, social levels, social, social backgrounds. And also Procter & Gamble are addressing the, the woman and female empowering and finally the the aliens uh, also also address these these same principles so uh, brands on ioc ioc level are trying to keep those those principles and those values in in first place actually a recent a recent report about the the consumer says that 73 percent of people believe that companies should should uh, do more than just offer a product or, or service. So this link between good values and, and um, separate or create a different relationship, ship, uh, not only seller and buyer, but also partners in this path 
it's very important and IOC is, being, is doing that, that path and NOC is also. So one question, you mentioned brands like Procter & Gamble and you know, obviously there's big money in sports and the multi-million dollar deals for Olympics or an NFL or a Premier League, I mean, huge dollars. Um, and you could look at those size of those and everything going on in the world and say, wow, when you start talking about the mental health and the obesity issues, is, is, enough, is enough money going towards youth sports in, in relation to just the overall money being put into sports? Um, so I'd ask that, I guess, overall to the group. And then the secondary thing would be, is there a brand that's doing something that's really inspiring you that gives us more hope? that other brands will follow their lead in terms of what they're doing for youth sports and creating opportunities? Actually, I don't know. I can, go, I can go ahead. Go ahead. I can, I can share my thoughts on that question. Actually, I think there are, there are brands that are doing that, but we, they have to think on the profit. I, I can, I can, I can, uh, everybody realize that, but we have, we need to to have a more financial inclusion and try to address grassroots levels because in particular in portugal we have different levels of uh, financial and human resources football is the main main uh, sports uh, that have the the main budget and the, the biggest budget so if we have a better better distribution of money we could have uh, a equal or equal conditions for everyone I, I do know that this maybe is a, could be a miracle because the, the, the sponsors and partners need to have revenues and profits, but maybe with a different mindset, we could get there one day. Um, so, so building off that, maybe a little bit of a non sequitur, when you talk about the new generation of stronger voices and athletes as brands and speaking up more than ever on social issues, consumers being able to have an impact. You, know, you mentioned the 73% number you know, Tokyo has 80% of people saying they don't want the Olympics to come there. Um, and brands always have the risk reward. Nike comes out with Colin Kaepernick commercial, their stock goes way down, then it goes way up. Um, for, the, for other folks also to add on the panel, where are you seeing brands that have made a, took a, taken a stand that have positively impacted sports that are, again, positive signs towards what is important and, and where the values of sport can be can be shown overall to consumers. Um, Paul, I know, I know you'll have some thoughts on that. And, and Evan, I know you, your pla platform is for sponsors. So I'm curious where sponsors are getting directly involved in that. Yeah, um, if I could uh, share in that. Um, here in the Philippines, there's one thing um, when it comes to sports. It's mostly sports teams. It's mostly owned by brands. Um, and I know that's what we are talking about today. And in the Philippines, um, Basketball is the number one sport. We have, we sh you know, just like the U.S., we share a passion for basketball, um, and it's it's important uh, that these teams do uh, support this. Uh, sorry, these brands do support these teams because aside from giving the opportunity to these athletes uh, com to compete and you know do the the sport that they love, um, they also get to use these athletes as marketing tools just to share their values as well. So this, this team shared their values with the companies. Um, for, for example, um, um, one of our ba professional basketball teams, San Miguel, they have, a value, they have the value of doing the right thing, having integrity. Um, and with their athletes, you, know, you can see that they have sportsmanship um, and they, they teach that in their coaching staff. You, know, you, you don't really see lots of brawls coming on. Uh, you know, I know it's part of the sport, but you know, they, this athletes really show that aside from the, the values of the sport, they also have the values of the company and having that integrity. Um, anybody else in terms of brands that are just inspired you in terms of what they're doing and using sports as a platform? Dan, I, I would, um, you know, going back to both your, la your last two questions and going back and I'll get to brands in a second, but as, as Joel said that, you know, there's a lot of evidence and Evan pointed it out that when you play sports, you're able to focus more, you're able to set goals more, you're able, you're a healthier person physically, you're able to manage stress. And look at this last year and what it's done to all of us in terms of stress, in terms of focus, in terms of being healthy. And so it is critical 
for corporations and brands to, to invest in youth sports now because we are, uh, many of our programs are fighting for survival. And so they need that investment just to be around in the post COVID era. But also, as I said in, in my earlier comment, it's more than sport. I mean, this is racial and social justice. When, when someone's able to be able to focus and do well and set goals and have a positive peer group that buffers them from negative activities, they're going to succeed in life. And just because you're born in a underserved area does not mean you should be denied that opportunity. And that opportunity comes from sport. It doesn't, it comes from sport more than probably any other activity. So brands like in, in my case, um, Adidas and Allstate who are investing in coaches to say, how do we get more kids to have those benefits of sports? It starts with the coach. It starts with having an adult who's there every single day. And I would argue that to our listeners all over the world, every single one of your communities could use more consistent and quality trained coaching who's out there every day to engage kids. And imagine if that coach is wearing you know, a brand and what it says to the community about that brand's conscientiousness of what needs to happen and how we need to take care of each other. And that's why, you know, I am inspired by Adidas and Allstate and other companies like that that invest in coaching. Um, any other thoughts? Yeah. Because I'm also curious what people's thoughts are on why more brands aren't spending more money in, sport, in youth sports because of what all the positive things you mentioned, Paul, versus some more, you know, one more Formula One deal or these big multi-million dollar sponsorships that I know as youth sports organizations, one of those big multi-million dollar deals, the impact it could have is so enormous. But then it's like, how does it go back to, you know, companies that are publicly traded and how they show it, how it impacts their bottom line? Evan, you? Yep. So uh, yeah, to answer your original question about our brand spending enough uh, money on, on youth sports specifically, I'm a bit biased, but the answer is definitively no. Uh, <laughs> and, and, there's, and there's two key reasons. One is, Youth sports are, are super fragmented. It's difficult to effectively invest in, in supporting youth sports organizations. And if you ask all of us the best way to support youth sports, we'll probably all have a different answer. There's, there isn't one clear way. Uh, and the other reason is uh, you spoke to Nike before. It, publicly traded entities have a responsibility to their team, to their stakeholders to, to invest in areas where it's proven that it'll have a positive impact uh, on their business and, and ultimately positive, positively uh, impact their, their stock price. Uh, so what we've done at Leakside is, is we've uh, focused a lot of our time and energy on showing these brands that you could do well by doing good, that by supporting youth sports organizations, not only can you help kids play sports, you know, not only can you invest in, in improving coaching for kids to play sports, which will help them in life, but by doing that, people are going to be more loyal to your brands. People, uh, and, and ultimately, it's going to help uh, the business side uh, of that youth sports investment, too. And so to your been, point about... Yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to build off. Sorry. You mentioned something earlier that I thought was interesting. You said a trend in brands talking about how some, how platforms can drive sales versus connecting loyalty with consumers. Could you, could you touch on that of what trends you're seeing from brands shifting? Yeah. T-Mobile is, is a great example that uh, it's a global brand, which uh, you, we could see here in, in the United States, how they're big sponsors of the MLB and a big part of their MLB partnership is every run that scored, particularly in the playoffs, there's going to be dollars donated to local baseball leagues uh, across the country. Uh, and uh, there's studies that have shown how T-Mobile's brand loyalty has significantly increased. Their uh, stock price is doing well, and, and they're continuing to become a leader in telecom, but they've done a really good job of tying uh, their top of funnel, building awareness, to going all the way down the funnel of building loyalty uh, with, with their target consumers as well. And Dan, and he, and, go ahead, Paul. I, I just want to add, because I'm following up on what Evan was saying, that, that uh, uh, 
you know, a lot of reasons that we're not seeing invest the level of investment in youth sports that I think it deserves is because we're also kind of moving a big mountain here. And we're trying, the mountain was that for a lot of brands, sports was something recreational and fun and it just happened. And we, there were two things that brands didn't pay attention to. One is that it's not just happening anymore, that it's actually disappearing in low income and underserved communities. And we are losing a lot of potential athletes and potential benefits by bringing, by keeping, preserving sports in these communities, which are consumers and fans one day. And then second is, we, it was always anecdotal that I'm an athlete and so I have goals in life. But we know now from studies that if you play sports, you are going to have certain mental health skills, certain life skills that are exceptional, that are going to lead to your benefit, that are going to lead to your economic mobility, and that are going to make you a consumer, a better consumer someday for those brands. So we didn't know that years ago. So now the message of a forum like this is to get that out to corporations and brands to say, this isn't just anecdote anymore. This is real. We need to preserve sports and we need to, to, and we have evidence that this cause is directly correlated to the health and well-being of your consumers. It's no longer anecdotal, it's real. Now, is there, when we talk about Olympic level athletes, um, you know, professional athletes, they're obviously put on pedestals. More than ever, they have a stronger voice and impact on kids because they're, they're speaking up more on social issues as well. They go direct through all the social platforms to consumers versus having to go through their teams or leagues. What's the good side of that? And, and then there's the side of I have an 11 year old where I remember three years ago asking a soccer coach about my son playing soccer. And he's like, oh, how old is he? And he said, he's eight. And he's like, oh, it's too late. Like he's not going to be able to play at the top level, like uh, related to accessibility for all and how can brands, but also organizations create that access, but not have the focus beyond just being the elite elite and specialization in sports to make sure it continues to have the impact that Paul was referencing. Yeah, um, if I could add, add in that, because um, there's a specific br brand in uh, the Philippines, which is Chicks to Go, which is a roast chicken brand of all, of all <laughs> kinds of brands, that they, they own uh, a team, uh, sorry, uh, or, uh, organization, which is the 3x3 basketball. And they do have a professional league, which was just started uh, 2019, just before the pandemic. Um, but also they do create... Um, programs for the grassroots uh, like for example um and they have a world record of this for the FIBA youth training um uh, tournaments um they had over a thousand participants for boys and for girls uh who beat uh, the boys record uh for 1600 participants and that shows that um they do cr they do uh, support athletes from a younger age and the good thing about this it wasn't held in a city like Metro Manila, which is more uh, developed, but they held this in the center of um, the Philippines, which is the Visayas region, which is a more underdeveloped uh, region of the Philippines. And you know, it gives uh, lots of opportunities to the kids there. Um, so let me pose the question. So this is a, a chicken company um, and, and there's, you know, obviously economic challenges with COVID. Um, Paul referenced youth sports overall, desperately needs money to have the impact. So where does the responsibility lie in navigating through when you talk about integrity, integrity and ethics? So say that chicken company wanted to do a grassroots program for kids, but their main items are, are 5,000 calories. And like, I'm, I'm making this up, but if it was super unhealthy or, you know, mm -hmm. a Big Mac is not what you'd be wanting to eat seven days a week. But then if McDonald's wants to use a youth program to promote um, their Happy Meals, how do you navigate through that? Wanting their money to drive positive change, but also not being out, sending the wrong message depending on the brand or the, what the brand's product is. Yeah, um, one, th one example I wanna talk about there was the one I said earlier, San Miguel. Um, the, the basketball team is San Miguel Beer Men. And it's at the, they do have other products like food, they do have milk, they do have uh, al even alcohol, um, like uh, aerobic alcohol. Uh, but their main product, uh, which started the comp with the corporation, was beer. And yes, it, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't want to say that a, a team supporting alcohol and hey, everyone go drink. But it shows they, what they, what they uh, 
market is actually the values of the corporation. So it's not really about, sometimes not really about the product they're selling, but what the company stands for. And you can see that in the product, the, the programs they do in the local communities, helping, uh, giving scholarships uh, to underprivileged uh, children, you know, giving opportunities, not only for professional athletes, but also for um, uh, grassroots, the grassroots uh, sports. Um, and that show just shows that you know it doesn't really have to be about the product itself, but what they stand for. So, any any other thoughts mm-hmm. related to that? Have, have any of you had situations where you have to make an ethical choice related to taking the money of a brand and it may not be aligned with the mission of youth sports? Or certain certainly something that that we need to deal with at, at league side. Uh, what what we've uh, our, at the end of the day, our mission is to make youth sports more accessible. We have a mission to, to give as many kids the opportunity to play sports uh, as possible. And uh, we give every youth sports league in our network the opportunity to accept or reject a, a sponsorship offer from a different brand. So uh, we've determined that the, the benefits of a, of a sponsorship uh, w- within reason, we'll, we'll never provide a, a, a sponsor in the alcohol space or, or tobacco space to a youth sports organization. But a company like McDonald's that you mentioned, the reason they're such a massive company is because millions and millions of people rely on McDonald's for affordable food. Uh, so not only do the benefits of helping more kids play sports uh, outweigh uh, the cost of a potentially unhealthy brand, but the benefits of making, uh, connecting McDonald's with their target consumers, which are people that rely on, on them uh, regardless uh, in order to eat, uh, we think is, is just moving the, the conversation forward in, in a good way. You know, I'll add to that too, Dan. Uh, I think it's really important, and my experience running a nonprofit, well, several nonprofits for my entire career, it's important that we develop partnerships with our corporate partners because all of us can improve, but the only way we improve is if we learn from one another. And so it's not just fund me, but it's, hey, can I be meeting with your team every month and sharing you know, what we're learning from, the, from the, our customers, our, our youth, and what, what you should be learning from your consumers and, and what, what your products mean. And we have those kind of fully integrated relationships and I would argue that anyone in this field, especially in the nonprofit field, should seek these sort of multi-developed relationships where you're a partner with your agency. And I'll just give one really quick example. Uh, you know, as I run a, a organization that recruits, trains, and supports coaches all over urban America, um, the vast majority of my coaches are Black and Latinx. And, uh, and I work with a lot of companies that have diversity issues. But what they did is said, let's work together and let's see how we can become educated from your work and how we can possibly create jobs for your coaches that can lead and create a more diverse workforce in our corporation. And that's the kind of symbiotic relationship that needs to happen, not just by saying thanks for the check, but hey, let's start a dialogue too and be sure that we're both better off at the end of this partnership than when we started it. And how for the group, you know, because look, budget challenges for nonprofits and impact, you know, again, you see these kit deals or or logos of of brands on jerseys for millions of dollars. What needs to happen to get over the hump to get more brands to see the light of the impact they can have on health and wellness and fitness and and access to sports, the simple aspect of like courts. and, And part of it is like some sports, just the cost of even share equipment, sports like hockey or that like where it costs a lot to get into the sport or golf, like what, what, what's going to be the shift to get more brands to be putting more money into participation in youth sports? Making it easier for, for uh, brands to uh, reach families on a local level uh, and, and showing that it is impactful uh, as, as a marketing investment, uh, not just uh, a donation. Uh, and if we're able to do both of those things effectively, we're already seeing it that there continues to be more and more investments from larger corporations into youth sports organizations. 
Anyone else? Actually, uh, if I if I may, I, I didn't want to interrupt earlier, but I, I totally agree what 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 have been saying, uh, including uh, one example of a good approaching we, uh, between sport and brands are the Kinder Sport uh, program, which I think it was a, a success for uh, uh, for grassroots levels, and also I think there's an important message that governments, particularly on my case, on my currently. My work that 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 uh, that I do uh, at NOC, uh, uh, national governments could have important role on this, uh, like the the help that gives to the sports universe, uh, creates conditions to those sports uh, stakeholders to create conditions to grow and then have place to to bring more brands to invest on them. So. Something like so simple as uh, give importance to the sports sector in a country could give millions to that sector from the private side of, of it. So it's just a, a thought that I have, and we struggle internally in Portugal to give this to sport the social importance that it should have. What um, what about the responsibility? You talk about you know we've got educational institutions. You're representing a national Olympic committee, obviously. Countries can do huge efforts to bid on games. There's been a lot of scandal in the past of bribery to win bids because of the economic impact of hosting an Olympic Games or large, um, or large sporting events. I mean, the cost of these sporting events and the cost of the stadiums is insane, right? When you look at the size and then relative to, say, the Philippines with the money that's being spent on sport in a good way um, with limited resources uh, in terms of the budget. What... Where, where can, whether youth sports or brands, um, where, where's their place to speak up and say, hey, we're spending too much on these stadiums when we don't have enough courts or access for kids to be playing in communities and we need more coaches versus another billion dollar stadium. Are brands speaking up on that at all? Or who, who are the voices that are inspiring that are trying to like talk about some stuff to maybe um, to make change? Yeah, um, if I could add into that, um... Um, just like how Jai was saying, uh, I really do believe that there should be a partnership between government and business when it comes to sports development. Um, you know, uh, for example, we have one of the most famous Filipinos, Mari Pacquiao. He is in, right now in government, and he he came from the poorest of the poor. He comes from the southern part of the Philippines, um, and you know, e even just getting out of there through like education or through another job. That's very difficult already, and he used he used his talent in sports to become you know one of the most influential people in the world and one of the biggest advocates for sports in the Philippines. You know, aside from making a semi-pro professional league, um, the Maharlika Filipinas Basketball uh, League, he also supports um, e-games. So it, it's it's not just you know focusing on one sport. He also gives a help. He also helps. Um, this community, which is a, a very, uh, it's a very uh, poor uh, community, and also gives lots of scholarships. So, you know, athletes, governments, um, businesses should really work together, um, putting all their funds together, because there's really only limited funds, especially from national governments like the Philippines, you know, they, they're focusing in education, they're focusing on health, but, you know, the sports can be linked to health and education, you know, so if, if they combine those uh, things with government or with businesses, it would uh, work it, out better. Absolutely. I mean, whether Manny Pacquiao or, or, you know, you see what James Blake, who was a longtime professional tennis player now doing grassroots initiatives with the USTA, um, seeing all the voices that the NBA players had um, to really speak up for social activism. The athlete voice is stronger than ever. Um, they're getting involved in ownership. You know, Michael Jordan, who for many years was famous for his quote, you know, saying, Republicans and Democrats both buy sneakers. Now he's he's doing new things like invested in a, a NASCAR team with Bubba Wallace, a, a black driver. Like so, there's definitely been a continued shift. Any other examples of pro athletes that have been inspiring? That um, because as we all know, kids look up to pro athletes. So the more they can be examples to participate in sports and then gain the confidence and all the benefits that you get from sports. Any other? Any other? Um, athletes specifically that have been inspiring to the panel? Recent, uh, if, I, if I may, recently we had the example of uh, Rashford 
we in England uh, started to give from his own pocket uh, meals to poor children in United Kingdom. I don't know if it was only in London, but I guess it's all it was all over the, the, the country, which it was a good example for young children to see an athlete that spent all the lockdown time trying to do a better world outside, if, uh, if I can say. Super. Any, any other examples from the group? And this can be more as almost fans or, or you know, consumers of sport yourselves. Yeah. I always find uh, everything that – in the United States, I think that the NBA has done a great job of, of uh, creating platforms for all the superstars in the NBA. And uh, they've all really developed their personal brands uh, – and so many people are now fans of NBA players instead of particular NBA teams. And uh, taking LeBron James, for example, uh, he's done such an incredible job just being such a great role model, which, which I appreciate considering he became a superstar from the time he was still in high school at 16. Uh, but through making sure that kids back in his hometown in Akron, Ohio, can get scholarships to, to go to, to the university, uh, and always speaking to not just how to stay in health physically, but, but mentally speaking to his mental well-being. Uh, LeBron and so many NBA players have done a great job of being role models to this next generation of athletes that, that are coming up. Absolutely. I mean, what, what LeBron's done with Akron and the college scholarships is amazing. Um, you, you mentioned something that's interesting in terms of the responsibility of brands within this. Um, there was a recent issue with Justin Thomas, the golfer, who made a homophobic slur when he missed a putt. And I believe one brand immediately um, stopped their relationship with him. Another brand asked that he donate some of the money. Um, what's brand's responsibility when athletes, they're doing sponsorships of an athlete or a team related to integrity when something happens? Do we think then there should be a immediate cancel culture, especially if someone's 18 or 19, a young person who's just finished a competition and may make a mistake. There's been a lot of discussion of cancel culture that immediately one mistake and athletes, you know, are, are out of something. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that related to brands and also athletes? I think the short answer is it depends. Uh, there, there's such a wide spectrum of, of things that could occur. And back to what Paul said earlier, I think it's important to think of it not just as a sponsorship, but a partnership. So uh, if your partner is misrepresenting you, then I think it's totally appropriate and, and admirable to, to stand up for, for what you believe in and what the core values are uh, of your brand. But I also do believe, not speaking to any specific instance, I believe in, in second chances and, and, uh, and uh there, there's an opportunity for a partnership to get stronger a, a, after a potential lull. Definitely. Um, uh, I've got a couple questions from the, from the audience. So I'll throw out, um, there's one question from uh, jo Joanna uh, Gon Goncalves. I probably mispronounced the name, I apologize. Project manager for the Portuguese Olympic Committee. Where do we draw the line between brands and integrity? For example, betting companies. Um, you know, there's a lot of economic impact, especially with the financial challenges that sports leagues and teams are having with COVID. The betting money is a gift of new, a new revenue stream. Um, what, 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 do you, what are your thoughts on that related to how sports leagues or teams should navigate that and, and how consumers should look at that, say for betting companies specifically, you could, you could say alcohol companies, um, especially when it comes to things that are for kids 18 and under that they may get exposure to. Well, from a youth perspective, uh, I mean, we have to draw the line, period. <laughs> I mean, these are things that are not good for young people. Um, they they participate they're disproportionately marginalizing young people in certain communities. And so we just have to draw the line. I mean, that, that's the bottom line on that. Uh, I, I, and also, Dan, I want to keep on that question, but I just want to say to Evan's point before, we've often asked our kids, our young athletes, about you know, what would you do if a professional athlete made a mistake? And it's so interesting to hear young athletes say their voices to say, we all make mistakes. Interesting. And that we need to find a way to educate them. 
not necessarily to condemn them forever, but to educate them so that they beca can become a spokesperson of the more positive value than the one that they mistakenly or for whatever reason uh, represented in a negative way. So I just wanted to throw that out there that I love hearing the voices of young athletes in this space. But to your question, from where I stand, panel, we, we cannot work with you know, alcohol companies and things that, that explicitly are negative to young people's well-being. Um, any other yeah. thoughts? Uh, if I could add to what Paul said, yeah, I totally agree. Like, there, when, especially when it comes to youth, there are the right brands. You know, the the sport, sport in you know, as a whole, has many kinds of sports that you can sponsor. You know, there's appropriate brands for appropriate for the specific sports. Like, for example, you can say maybe alcohol is more alcohol company. They they have the, you know they have their own values and everything. Could support maybe billiards, but would you you want them to support a youth team? Maybe not. You know, there, there are appropriate brands for that. And, um, you know, I don't want, I, I personally wouldn't want to just, you know, say to, to one company for all the, you know, the, 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 the good reasons why they want to support a team. Like, hey, you can't support it because this is your brand. This is how you make money. Uh, there are, you have to just like check it out with them with, if they have the right values. You know, if, if they do have some corruption, integrity issues, definitely do not um, have them as sponsors. But, you know, if they, if they hold that kind of integrity, with them as a corporation, then you know there are specific uh, sports that they can sponsor. Interesting. Um, another good question from uh, Alejandro Castillo, the head of marketing for Cona Deep from Mexico City. Um, I mean, there's been so much change to college athletics and the huge with football and basketball in particular, the money that the NCAA, for example, in the United States has lost this year of revenue streams and the big money of college sports overall. Um, the football coaches of many of the state universities are the highest paid employee of the state. Um, what are the integrity implications of student athletes being paid um, that's going to be happening in the NCA with the uh, name image likeness rules that are changing? Um, what, what do you see as the, the integrity uh, issues that are going to arise from that, which there'll be many, I'm sure. Let's get the lawyer perspective, Joe. Joe, Al, what do you, what do you think? No, actually, I I, I just uh, I I wanted to add something on the on the previous question. I, okay. I have to to apologize for no no worries this one. But uh, actually, in Portugal, uh, there's a very ironic situation where the main the main the main sports universe, the main uh, agents from the the sports universe, are funded. Uh, f by an institute, a government institute that, which is funded by the results and the revenue from betting. So, cutting the betting from uh, from sports will be a catastrophic situation for sports in Portugal. So, it's very interesting to see that the, the, that perspective is it's a, the healthy, the healthier one. But actually, we should have a big problem on that in Portugal. And I don't have the solution. I, I I would say that there's a lot of ways to get there and to 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 get the equal financial situation for everybody, uh, despite the the revenues from the the the, the betting uh, companies. But I don't know which which is the best solution. But I I would suggest to 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 erase sponsorships from betting companies to to sports uh, uh, grassroots levels and all other clubs. Interesting. You know, it begs the question, um, who thinks that college athletes should be paid or should they not be paid? Because, you know, the theory of the NCAA was they're getting a college education for free through a scholarship. Now, there's a whole separate issue of many then scholar athletes not graduating and the university is kind of leaving them behind. But uh, any, any thoughts on that? Oh, uh, well, uh, I guess I, I'll be the right person to answer that. Because um, I do have lots of friends who are student athletes. Um, and the thing with Sambeda, uh, I want to, like, to inform everyone that many of our athletes, especially um, in the other sports aside from basketball, get their athletes from developed, you know, the poorer regions in the Philippines. Like, for example, I have friends um, from Davao City, which is one of the southernmost uh, cities. Um, I have people from, you know, uh, cities that are always, or provinces that are always struck by um, typhoons, which would affect their economy. Um, so when, you know, when it comes to the, the issue of should athletes 
be paid. Um, you know, speaking to them, sometimes education wouldn't be everything just because they do have to think about, you know, it's my family eating. No, I, I, especially I have a friend, um, uh, he, he held records for shot putting and, and the collegiate level in the NCAA in the Philippines. Um, and he, his family is just a farming family. So, you know, those things have to be thought about, especially by the administrators, um, as well as, you know, if there's laws that are, are, are being breached when you pay these athletes. But definitely, if you ask me, if the athletes were paid, I wouldn't have a problem with it. I personally wouldn't have a problem. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts? Mm-hmm. Or I want to... I want to shift back to health and wellness for a second related to youth sports, but any other thoughts on that subject? But David, I, I agree with you. I, I, I mean, I really do. I feel that athletes, if we look at the major sports in America, basketball and football, and you look at how much the coaches are play, paid and the fact that, you know, we do similarly, many of our athletes are not all, but many are from low income communities. They have a full-time job being NCAA athletes and they're getting paid nothing while their coaches are profiting from them as often young black and brown men and men and women, but young black and brown men in basketball and football. And I think there's an injustice there. I think that that's, that's, that's a systemic injustice that probably needs to be addressed finally, that if we're going to demand this much out of a college athlete and we're going to recruit him from this neighborhood and pay his coach this much, it shouldn't be considered free labor. Um, I, I agree. And I think the responsibility of ensuring that once their eligibility of playing is up, um, the stats of how like the universities really aren't, they could do more to make sure that those students continue to get educated and get their degrees because the number of athletes, once their eligibility is up, that, that lose that is, uh, is it, it, that number needs to change. What, a, what about health and wellness, you know, from a brand standpoint, I mean, Separate from climate change, the obesity epidemic in the world is one of the biggest issues. And then the, the domino effect of the costs associated with healthcare, separate from just an active, healthy lifestyle, you know, should brands be doing more just from that standpoint? Because the implications, particularly, Paul, you mentioned Allstate. I mean, there's brands that have a direct benefit if, if kids are healthier and grow into healthy adults. And then there's also the government's responsibility. Why aren't, why aren't governments putting more money into sports just from a health and wellness and active lifestyle and anti-obesity initiative? Yeah, well. I was gonna say, yeah, but in most countries, I think they are. Well, for, um, um, in in most advanced Western quick. countries. Um, and I think in a lot of other countries as well, I think America is a little behind the eight ball on this in terms of our government investing in sports. And we have left it to our corporations to say that we need to take a stand on the, these childhood obesity rates. And I do think that we could get a better, and I'm not suggesting sports becomes a, a government bureaucracy of, of Washington, DC, but I do think we can get a better, more focused investment in tackling this obesity if our federal government did bring together brands and say, we need to have a sports policy. And that sports policy needs to be sure that regular physical activity through sports is available to kids across this country on an egalitarian way so that we can address this issue of fitness, health, and safety, and we can evaluate it and show its impact in terms of life, in terms of uh, quality of life, and disease prevention. So I think we have a ways to go here in this country. And I think there are some models of countries that are actually leading the way with government sports policies. Yeah, and we haven't even touched on really the, um, the stats also for girls participation in sports and the confidence levels and then what that looks like when they get out of college or university in terms of positive impact on their careers and income opportunity. Um, and. I know, David, uh, you mentioned it was interesting, the basketball initiative in the Philippines that had about 50% more women, or I'm sorry, more young, young girls and women participating. Um, is that a trend in the Philippines? Like what, what do you think sparked that such a higher percentage of girls participating than boys? Yeah, um, I think it's a it's change of culture. Um, you know, I, I don't want to really speak bad about our culture, but the fact is that we were a more male dominant um, society and culture. But right now in the Philippines, 
girls are there are more girls that are in sports you know and it's not just in one sport because we have this stereotype where men play basketball women play volleyball but it's not the case right now in, in recent years the more dominant uh, teams in the 3x3 basketball were the women's team they they reached farther and that just shows that you know it, it's not just one one gender or one sex that can uh, dominate a sport. It's, it could be everyone, and it should be inclusive for everyone. Yeah. Um, so when you talk about if if all of you are getting into an elevator and suddenly the chairman of Goldman Sachs was in the elevator with you, or a huge multinational company, and you have to convince him as to why they should be investing more in youth sports, that's going to help impact their bottom line because he's about to go into his board meeting pretend and he's focused on their stock price and quarter earnings. What's, what's the pitch to that global executive as to how it's going to impact their bottom line? Because the more, I think the more we can show corporations impact on their company's success, the more they're going to invest in sports separate from just altruistic reasons. Good. The pitch to Goldman specifically, and I see the red zero flashing on the screen. So I don't know if we're, if this is about to, to uh, shut down, but you know, Goldman just just launched a is launching a, a retail bank, uh, and this is an incredible way to. Uh, if if you ask a six year old what is your favorite bank, even though they don't know what a bank is, they all have a favorite bank. They, they like the colors of uh, TD uh, Bank or they like the shape of, of the Chase logo. Uh, and this is a great way to get consumers at, at a young age thinking about your brand, which is going to lead to them becoming consumers in the future, while simultaneously helping kids be healthier, both physically and mentally by playing sports, uh, being able to get on the field from a really young age. I like it. Pa Paul, what, I know you have some thoughts on this. I would tell them that, listen, after 2020, this is not the world that you knew before 2020. And that there is never going to be a, a, a way things were after, uh, going forward. And part of that is that your consumer, your brand, whether or not it's a household brand or it's Goldman Sachs, that's somewhat you know, less accessible to the everyday person, that your brand is still gonna be judged uh, post 2020 on how much you are conscientious about this world, about the dynamics of issues like race and social justice, about equity when it comes to health, when it comes to education. The consumer is gonna judge every single company out there after this year as to what their grade is on those issues. So go into that company and use the world's greatest platform, the one that we all celebrate no matter how controversial the issue, we galvanize around sport and use that as your methodology for saying, we will care and make a difference around these issues. That's what I would tell them. I, I love it. On that note, I think uh, let's wrap it up on that because that uh, is a hopeful, positive message, the powerful impact that sports can have on, on kids and really people of all ages. Um, so Paul, Evan, David, um, Joao, thank you all so much for sharing your perspectives. Um, I think the future is bright. Uh, brands can have an impact on the integrity of sport and continue to get kids exposure to the positive aspects of, of playing sport on any level. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. My name is Alexandra, I'm a proud member of Sport Integrity Global Alliance Youth Council. We are now in full action mode and would like to invite everyone who cares about the future of sport integrity and sport industry to join us at the SIGA Youth Forum on 27th and 28th of January. We have been divided for almost over a year and while this pandemic threatens an already fragile world of sport, it also provides a unique opportunity to address unresolved integrity issues and develop long-lasting solutions. To ensure that sport recovers with integrity, we are calling on all stakeholders to cooperate and navigate through the challenges in a joint manner and to stand with SIGA. 
Don't forget to download your app and update your contact information so that you can benefit from endless opportunities of networking with sport industry professionals, young professionals and athletes just like you are. See you there! In 2020, we learned a lot about ourselves, what is truly important to us and that we need to be prepared for the unpredictable. As the world begins to return to a sense of normality, it was the return of sport that for so many of us provided what was the first comforting feeling of normal. It showed how important sport is globally and that the things that strive to ruin sport such as corruption, discrimination and doping need to be stopped now more than ever. Here at SEGA, we are setting the path for the future of sport with one mission, one vision and one collective voice with the SEGA Sport Integrity Goals. Good governance, outstanding ethic of conduct, accountability, legality scrutiny. This week we take a huge stride towards these goals at our inaugural youth forum. The two amazing days filled with forward thinking webinar sessions from an exceptional selection of global youth leaders where we will discuss a wide variety of important topics and issues including race, gender, diversity and inclusion, youth development and child protection in sport and esports and the integrity challenges that it will face in its future amongst many others. We are preparing for the future today so we hope you can join us on the 27th and 28th of January. Uh, we hope to see you there and please remember to stand with Seager.